Hello and welcome to week five, the final week of the course. We'll be looking at ethics of artificial intelligence. This lecture, which is the first lecture of week five, will uh, actually cover two very short readings that I've sort of grouped together. Um, the first is by Eric Schwitzgabel, and this is actually a, a piece for the New York Times, uh, no, or LA Times. Um, anyways, it's a newspaper article. Um, and He's just bringing up some of the issues of AI and does sort of argue for a specific thesis about who should be responsible for sort of deciding um, how AI works in the context of driverless cars. So the title of the piece is, Will Your Driverless Car Kill You So That Others May Live? So it begins with a scenario. So let's imagine that you and let's imagine you have a daughter and you're driving along the PCH or riding really, right, in an autonomous vehicle. So your, your hand is not on the wheel, the vehicle is doing the driving. Um, after rounding a corner, you start to brake, right? You know there are some children crossing a crosswalk ahead of you. Um, got a little late start on it because of the blind corner, right? Um, the car's driving along, sees the children, begins to brake, but um, there's sand all over the, the road, right? And so all of a sudden the brakes aren't getting traction and the car calculates that you are not going to be able to stop in time uh, to avoid these children. So now the car still has a choice, right? And the choice is the car could avoid killing the children if it veers and drives off a cliff, uh, killing you and your daughter. The question is, what's the right thing to do, right? There's a question of what's the morally right thing to do, but more specifically, there's the question of how should we program this car, right? Should it choose you plow into the children, or should it choose to drive you off the cliff? So autonomous vehicles are programmed to protect pedestrians. They're also right, programmed to protect their drivers or their riders that are in the car. Um, but of course, these goals are not always in harmony, right? As in the uh, previous scenario, right? Sometimes those two goals conflict. We would like to save everyone's life. Sometimes you have to make a choice. Now, the DMV is working on regulations for autonomous vehicles, um, and they may include rules about sort of acceptable risk. So, you know, technically you're never supposed to cross a double yellow line, but maybe you would be allowed to, right, if you want to avoid a collision. Uh, and maybe we should program the uh, driverless cars to sort of calculate these sorts of acceptable risks. Meanwhile, Google is uh, pushing to have sort of all their safety certification, everything done internally, rather than being subject to the DMV or other state uh, entities. Um, Schwitzgable, his main aim in this is to explore some of these issues, but ultimately to argue that that's a bad idea. Right? Companies should not be able to make these ethical decisions on their own, these programming decisions. This stuff needs to be done with public input because these are substantial matters of moral controversy, right? humans and for all of us involved and we need to be involved in progress in this what's the word I'm looking for project whatever. um okay acceptable risk so one issue that could come up um you can't see the future um entirely within with complete certainty and certainly these cars will not be able to um we're probably going to be dealing with some uh, measure of probability, right? So uh, you could program the cars. The rule is protect the driver at all costs, right? So if there's even a 5% chance of injury to the driver, then uh, kill the pedestrian, right? Um, that seems like the wrong way to do it, right? It seems that, okay, if I get a, a sore neck, right, or a broken arm, but it saves a life, then that's the, preferable outcome, right? So it seems like you probably shouldn't veer too far into merely protecting the car and its driver, um, but you also probably wouldn't want to go too far in the other extreme, right? So say you have a purely utilitarian rule that says just maximize the number of lives saved, right? They're all equal, um, added up. Well, that doesn't really account for people who put themselves into dangerous situa situations um, by being reckless, right? So if there's 
two other cars. I guess we'd have to cook up a situ situation where you have two drunk drivers that are both endangering you, right? Um, at any rate, you might say, well, I, I don't think my car should kill me to save two drunk drivers who are both sort of being irresponsible, right? So um, you might also have to work in some measure of the culpability of each of the parties for getting into the dangerous situation in the first place. You might want to have a range of different settings on the car, right? Depending on your preferred ethics. So um, maybe your child is in the car, so you want to program it to maximize the safety of the backseat passengers, right? At the expense of you in the front seat. Um, maybe you're driving by yourself and you just want to be more altruistic and say, Look, if we ever end up in this right kids on the crosswalk, crosswalk cliff situation, um, when I'm driving by myself, car just save the kid. Um, maybe that's possibly maybe that's an option you would want to have. I certainly, uh, Chris Gable seems to think that you know there should be, I guess, some minimum unselfishness standard. Again, you probably shouldn't be allowed by law to have your car, pro car programmed to save your life, save your life at all costs, right? Even if you're in the wrong or whatever. Um, would probably be some minimum standard, but maybe you ought to be able to go above and beyond that and be even more unselfish and more altruistic if you'd like to. Right? We will probably need some form of manual override. Um, so these cars are advanced, but they're not as good as human vision yet, right? Human vision has evolved for a long time and it's very sensitive to particularly the, the objects that are salient and relevant to us in our um, environment, right? Computers, it's the difficult thing with computers is training them to know what matters to us, right? Um, so a car might not be able to detect a woman pushing a shopping cart across the street in, in a swirl of leaves, you know, and wind. Um, so that's something our visual system would be able to potentially pick out better. Um, so you'll want the option to swerve, right? If, if And this has happened, you know, um, I think lately Teslas are, uh, I saw one recently where it couldn't distinguish the moon from like a stop sign or something or from a, a traffic light and kept slowing down, right? So they they have a little trouble still with their perceptual system. You, you do want the option for the humans to jump in. Um, and you certainly wouldn't want your car to mistake sort of a mirage in the road for a an obstacle and swerve off the road, right? Um, so it might seem weird to sort of offload all this moral responsibility onto the AI, right, uh, that exists in your car. But, you know, then again, future generations might view us as pretty nuts for letting sort of any 16 year old that can pass the test climb into a car, which is just a ton of steel, right, moving uh, 80 miles an hour down the road. Um, Self-driving cars never drive drunk. They don't get distracted, right, if they see a beautiful person and want to gawk or whatever. Um, you know, they don't have to turn around and yell at their kids in the back seat. So in many ways, self-driving cars could be much safer than human drivers, right? Human drivers in general, not the best, right? We, we have, we have a, a lot of failings as drivers. So that's really the sum. That's it for this, again, short article. It's a pretty simple thesis, right? The rules governing autonomous vehicles are important, complex, and they need to be debated publicly, right? And not arbitrarily decided by a tech company either. Now, moving on to this piece by Vincent C. Mueller, which is Autonomous Cognitive Systems in Real-World Environments. So Mueller is going to argue for more autonomy for uh, intelligent systems. So the basic thesis is that um, artificial cognitive systems need more flexibility to be able to interact in real-world and world environments, right? If we want systems that can actually do lots of stuff like drive our cars and um, uh, you know, write sort of robots that can that we can actually interact with and they're actually really useful, uh, they're gonna need more autonomy. His flexibility and autonomy go hand in hand is ultimately his thesis, right? And by autonomy here, he means the ability to, ability to formulate their own goals and plan for them. So sort of he situates this these possibilities of newer, better intelligent systems against the, the backdrop of traditional AI, sometimes called good old fashioned AI, GOF AI. Um, so, you know, originally uh, you had to sort of, 
program in every possible contingency, right? So um, they need to anticipate any sort of thing that the uh, the system might encounter and then program in a rule for what to do in that situation. Now, the obvious limitation of that is that you just can't predict every single situation, right? Um, so that's sort of, we end up with a sort of spectrum of possible approaches. So one is like very much like uh, the programmer is controlling every uh, part of the of the system, right? And it's just like a lookup table, situation A, here's what you do, situation B. Um, problem there again is like, you just can't anticipate every situation. And those those systems have been shown to be pretty brittle ever since really the 70s. And on the other end, and I think he's talking, he's not explicit, I think he's talking about sort of dynamical systems theory here, right? But there's also another view sort of on the opposite end of the spectrum that basically views like um, intelligent systems as hardly programmed at all, but instead just because of the their physicality and their natures, they're sort of like evolved for a certain niche and they don't really need much guidance at all. This sort of their morphology or their shape. Um, you can kind of think of a slinky, right? A slinky doesn't have to be intelligent to walk downstairs. It's just a, a result of the shape, right? And that's kind of the way dynamic systems theory is thought. But then those systems are not really very intelligent at all. And again, not very flexible, right? They're great in their niche, but um, you need something that can operate in a variety of environments, right? A slinky's not going to do much on a football field. Uh, so he wants to say that framing the problem as sort of action selection given a certain input may be the wrong track, right? Um, we need something much more fluid and intuitive. If you think of yourself like playing basketball and stuff like that, there's really very little about sort of choosing the right action in a given situation, it's very much subconscious level. You see the opportunities and you sort of like pursue them. Um, getting th this, is, this is sort of a whole literature and philosophy of mind and cognitive science about this stuff. And how really to model human intelligence. So at any rate, the idea is what, whatever the best model of the human mind, um, if you want flexibility, you're going to need autonomy. Um, so in control engineering, autonomy is defined in a specific way. It's, it's defined by the degree of interference uh, required or allowed by the user of the system, right? So a system that requires less interference by the user is more autonomous. So here's a one definition of autonomy. X is autonomous from Y if and only if X pursues its goals without input from Y. So this autonomy could be a matter of degree, right? It can also be relative to one factor, right? One particular type of input, one particular type of ability. So you might have a chess playing algorithm that's totally autonomous as far as chess strategy, but it may not be autonomous as far as like its power supply or things like that. can't turn itself on or things like that. Uh, word, pressing pro word processing program, program could be autonomous in, in its ability to check grammar, but it may not have any autonomy as far as creating the content, right? You'd need a user. Um, so importantly, right, X and Y both have to be agents in this formulation. So just because you depend on a particular sort of food source, something like that, that doesn't reduce your autonomy about and your ability to pursue your goals independently of other agents. Um, another way that autonomy has frequently been defined is in terms of being to set your own goals. Now there's a little trickiness in here because of the philosophy, the metaphysics of free will, right? So any rational system that is also a causal system, which would be all of them unless we believe in immaterial souls, um, and even then, there may be some form of causality at, at work. There's going to be this problem of free will, right? So how can I set my own goals if really, ultimately, everything is determined by firing synapses, the Big Bang, right? That's a whole causal system. I'm not outside it, right? So how do I set my own goals? Um, he offers one, you know, view. There's different ways that people have tried to work their way out of this group determinism, free will conundrum, right? So Frankfurt is an author who says, okay, you have autonomy if you can set goals about what kind of goals you want to set. Right? So you can say, like, say you're a smoker, right? And you say, I, I would like to be, I would like to not want to smoke, right? That's sort of this higher level goal setting that they're talking about. Um, 
just deciding that is the solution to the problem of free will is a little arbitrary, right? It's uh, if you get into the literature, it's not always super satisfying, but it's one way to think about it. Some people accept it, right? So if we grant all that stuff, here's another formulation of autonomy. Uh, agent X is autonomous from agent Y to the degree that X pursues its goals without input from Y, right? So again, it's about goal. What, another way to look at it is about goal setting. One way to look at it is about freedom from the influence of another agent. Another way is maybe being able to set your own goals. Um, so autonomy is not a necessary condition for intelligence. You can have intelligent systems that aren't autonomous really at all, but um, in the natural sort of environments where we want these systems to operate, right? If we're gonna design the next generation of intelligent systems to really help us out in things like driving cars, um, you really are gonna need some degree of autonomy um, in order to be flexible enough to operate in these environments and not be brittle or old fashioned, you know, again, machines, right? Able to make their own decisions. And so he introduces this, this little chart here, which sort of like puts flexibility and the success at its very specific tasks on a X, Y axis. So flexibility is on the Y, specific tax, task success on the X. So you can imagine, you know, something that's very good on the X axis, like a chess playing program, right? But it, it's not gonna be very flexible on the Y. It can only play chess. It's great at playing chess, but that's all it does. It's not gonna cook you dinner or drive you a car. On the left, we have some more sort of natural cognitive systems. Humans are gonna be further on the left. We're very flexible, right? But maybe um, we're very sort of general uh, problem solving intelligent machines, but maybe um, we're not as good as computers at very specific tasks. Um, and he notes sort of on this chart how much room there is, right, for new types of intelligent systems, right, that are different than the natural cognitive. Picture on that y axis, they, they could be much more flexible than humans if we wanted them to be in principle. The more flexibility required, right, the more autonomy is going to be required. Humans sit pretty close to the y-axis and rate pretty high in general flexible intelligence. But as we've shown, there's much more room for even greater flexibility. Um, and our natural environment is often unpredictable, but it's also fairly predictable. Right? So um, we would not be able to operate in a in an environment that required much more flexibility, right? Where the um, things were much less predictable and, and um, the contingencies were not sort of repetitive and stuff like that. Um, but maybe an intelligent system could operate in that sort of world, right? Where they needed more flexibility because there's much less repetition. Um, so in these sort of complex environments that creep up the y-axis, you might need other sorts of intelligence than human intelligence. All right. so. Finally, the final slide. So what is the issue is loss of control versus gain of interaction, right? So as defined, it appears that as users of intelligent systems, greater autonomy for those systems is going to be less control for us. And that feels like it's a bad thing. Um, but he's arguing that there are good things about autonomy that are, might outweigh that loss of control for us. Um, first of all, humans, right, the way we interact with other agents and really the basis on which I determined that you are an intelligent system, right? Something with a with a mind um, is by me being able to predict and explain your behavior by attributing goals to a sort of theory of mind. And I see in you a sort of creature that acts and behaves like I would, and I'm able to understand you and call you intelligent. Um, it's impossible to cooperate with someone if you have no sense of what their goals are, right? Um, and so he's saying that the basis of our ability to interact with each other like this is, is that we're both aut autonomous agents, right? We both have a lot of autonomy and that's how I'm able to understand you as having goals and desires and things that explain your behavior is because you're like me, you're much great, great deal of autonomy. So he's saying that if you want to be able to control intelligent systems, you need to be able to interact with them and able to interact with them. They actually need to be much more autonomous and much more like humans, right? He's saying autonomy is the basis of our ability to interact with um, that are much more intelligent. Than we're All right, so the next uh, um, lecture will also be on the ethics of AI and uh,
yeah, we're moving along, coming towards the end. So see you soon.